whoever is listening, however you're listening, I want to welcome you back. My name is Gray Man. This is the Man with the Plan podcast, episode 31. Guys, as always, thank you so much for the support. You continue to pour on the podcast. We are on YouTube, Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts. Guys, if you like what you hear, consider subscribing or leaving a five-star review to let us know that you are loving what you're seeing. It helps me continue to make better content for you guys, and we grow as a community as a result of it. So what do we have today? We have the NBA playoffs. We have the Saturday slate, what I saw, and I've got a little comparison that I hope you guys like. We've got what's going on today. Later on at 1 o'clock, we got the Sixers and the Wizards personalities on personalities. We've got the 4-5 Knicks-Hawks game. Loyalties will be decided. You know who you are if you're listening to it. We've got LeBron and the Phoenix Suns. Will the Lakers coast to a championship once again, or will the Suns be the roadblock that they weren't expecting? And then later, you've got the Jazz and the Grizzlies. Most view this as a sleeper, but John Morant and Donovan Mitchell are must-watch basketball. All right, let's talk about the NBA playoffs, what I saw yesterday. So we had the Heat and the Milwaukee Bucks, and let me just explain what I've been doing all week because it's been kind of thin on the podcast situation. So I had my friend's graduations yesterday. We had graduation parties. I had finished up spring ball with Pinewood Preparatory School. I was an assistant to head coach J.W. Myers. If you're listening to this coach, you got a fantastic team. I love what I saw from them. They are on the come up. Pinewood football is going to be a force to watch out for. And we, you guys want to do high school football. We can talk about Pinewood all day. I will boast. I will brag about them. I will be bombastic. I will be whatever it takes for those guys. That is my former high school. I am a proud alum. And it's just so great to see come back and work on that. It's such a unique perspective because I was a player for five years. And we had our ups and downs. And now I come into a new, come into a new scenario and it, being a coach, it, it gives you a certain level of appreciation. You have the inside out, how to set up a practice, how to do all the stuff. It's If you guys have an opportunity to be a graduate assistant or you have the ability to give back to your high school, I give you a 10. If you had to recommend, recommend something on a scale of 10, I would give 10 out of 10 to do it each time. I know it's a lame and old and tired way to put it, but I just love coaching. I love doing it. If it's something other than podcasting or sports broadcasting, which I want to do with my life, I'd love to be a head coach. It's so fun. It's just so much much happiness to be able to put together a group of players that want to be there, that want to make the team better, that want to show and represent their school and make something of it. And it's just, they don't have to be there. They're not being paid to be there. They're not working towards something. I mean, some are working for a college goal. And this is my little rant on high school football, but I just love it so much. So let's, let's get into the NBA playoffs. What did I see? So in the mix of Saturday, I was out of graduation. I was tired. <laughs> I got up super early. I had graduation parties. But I saw a couple like instances. The one game that I watched really closely was the Celtics-Nets. And I really thought that the Nets were going to take easy business of the Celtics. The Celtics, Jason Tatum, Kimball Walker. It's kind of a depleted roster. If you've watched Boston this year, it's been inconsistencies. It's been injuries. It's been covid Literally anything that could have gone wrong for Boston this year went wrong. A lot of questions are being thrown around. Who is the guy? What does the team look like? Is Brad Stevens the person to put them over the top? And there's a lot of yeses and there's a lot of noes. But what I saw was effort from the Celtics that I haven't seen in a long time. They're fighting. They're playing not to lose. If they had Jalen Brown, I think the series would be very interesting. It'd be like the interesting entry of the Suns and the LA Lakers with LeBron and AD. You've got the Challengers and the Suns. It's kind of flip-flop. The seven seed is probably going to win in the West Conference, and the seven seed is the underdog how it should be. But it's been flipped on its head because LeBron and AD have been hurt all year, so we don't know how to put it. I made an episode about the Lakers and the Nets in that finals, and how do we look at it? Let's pump the brake on it. I feel like I'm partially right to a sense. Part of me wants to say, yeah, I feel like I could still be right because I'm my finals prediction right now, if I had to make one, it'd be the... Philadelphia 76ers out of the East. I think Joel Embiid is a MVP snub. He had 29 points, 10, re- 10 I think it was 15. Re- it was something insane. But his Doc Rivers has been putting Philly on the map. And I think in the West, I think it could easily be the Suns if Chris Paul is able to put that team together. The way they play, it could be something really dynamic. Something that the Lakers haven't seen before, haven't faced yet. It'd be really something really, really interesting. 
But I what I took away from yesterday is that it finally matters. And I saw something. I was watching Colin Cowherd. You guys probably heard me say I've been watching Colin Cowherd a lot. I think Colin Cowherd's a great. He really thinks his takes out. He really thinks about what he does, especially with Jim Rome, Colin Cowherd. Those two guys are my favorite sports broadcasters of all time. Jim Rome's so funny. He's so full of life. Colin, serious. He's open-minded. It's something that you get the best of both worlds. I love Jim Rome. I love what they're doing. But I saw that Colin said that the NBA playoffs need to be shortened, and you need to take that and condense it into like certain games. I really would agree with that. If the first round was two out of three, and then you had two out of three for the second round, then you have these lower seed teams like Boston last night, that if they had nicked a game off the Nets, it would have been like, oh, whoa, it's they only need to win one more. And it could be really interesting. And you could go, how do they play the series out? How does home field advantage work? Like, you could go, I guess, Brooklyn gets two and Boston gets one if they have to go to two ga- like three games, something like that. But make the teams have urgency. You could have two bad games and then win the series 4-2. to two. You could have a really bad start 3-1. We've seen this before. And I guess you lose that epic comeback sense. But you can still have that seven-game series in the finals and something like that. But I think the NBA is at a point where they need listeners and they need people to be engaged at all times. If you had a first-round series that was only three games where it could be easily over if you just blinked, it'd be so much more interesting. This is why March Madness is so popular. Everybody loves March Madness a little more. Personally, I love March Madness a lot more than the NBA playoffs. Not that I don't love playoff basketball with all the stars that we have. I just love March Madness. That urgency, that passion, that fire, it's just so much fun it's so much it's just so much to break down so much to get involved into I absolutely love it today what I'm looking for with Sixers and the Wizards Hawks Knicks Suns Lakers and then the Jazz Grizzlies I just want to see competitive basketball I think that if the Suns take game one today it could be really interesting I think a lot of people could panic if LA takes game one because the Suns this is a very inexperienced team with the exception of Chris Paul who's going to be the been there done that but he's playing with a roster who it's most of their first playoff games. Devin Booker, DeAndre Ayton. My, it's um, McCall Bridges, I'm pretty sure. It's a good Suns team, but they need experience. They need that experience to drive them forward. And that's what they need. And if they get nicked on, if they get like taken off of a game one or game two, I don't worry about it. They'll pick up the pieces. They'll learn. Monty Williams is a fantastic head coach. Certainly a coach of the year candidate. They're going to have to put it all together and just learn how to be a playoff team. They need to learn how to be in this certain type of pressure, this atmosphere. Because they're going to have home court, home court advantage. They're going to be able to play on their terms. The Lakers are going to have to play like their lives are on the line every single night. And that's something that the Suns need to take advantage of. My other two games that I'm really excited for, Knicks-Hawks. The Knicks are going to be super fun to watch. The Hawks, I have to shout out, Addison Vinatelli. He's, he's been struggling as a Knicks fan. So he's like, alright, I'm done. This is the year I'm done. I'm going to be a Hawks fan now. And then the Knicks are good at basketball again. So this is the series that decides his loyalty. So Addison, if you're watching, your loyalty starts tonight. Who will you sway with? Who will you vote for? <laughs> um, I got to shout out a couple guys before we get into Gray's divisional breakdowns. I got to shout out Doug Holloway, my guy working at the PGA Championship right now. Phil Mickelson's up last time I checked on the TV before I came up to record. And then we have the guys from Cornhole yesterday at Logan, Van, and Addison's grad party. We got Price Lenore, we got Karen Rossi, Ben Beckwith, my brother, McGregor Mann, and then we got Gavin. It was so much fun playing cornhole. It, it was such a great party. Congratulations to class of 2021 at Pinewood Preparatory School. And if you graduated this year, congratulations. You're taking the next step. It's just a great thing. Great feeling. Congratulations to the guys. All right. Let's shift to Gray's Divisional Breakdowns. This is the new series. This is part two. Let's talk about the AFC South. We, of course, go in order from worst to first, and we do the 2020 outlook. Games to watch for, players to look out for, and, of course, a headline, a storyline that will drive the team forward. And then we will predict the standings of that division. And then at the end, when we've broken down all of the divisions, we're going to do a playoff show, the NFL playoff predictions, and then we're going to do awards and stuff like that as The camps roll in as stuff gets to be finalized. It's super fun. Let's start with the AFC South. We did the AFC West last week. It'll be, I'll make a new playlist in YouTube if you're a YouTube listener for Gray's Divisional Breakdown episodes so you can get 
all the divisions and you get all that information, all that knowledge, all that sweet, sweet knowledge. Let's start with last place. And it's not the Houston Texans as much as I was shocked to wind out. I was like almost having a brain fart. So let's talk about Jacksonville. Obviously, if you want to talk about 2020, they weren't satisfied with what I want to know. And then they went one and 15. And then that you could say to summarize 2020 tank for Trevor Lawrence. Trevor was the generational talent that everybody wanted. Everyone thought New York was going to get. Patriots fans, Dolphins fans, the Jets, or I guess Bills fans were like, no, not Trevor. Don't go there. And then Jacksonville lost out and the Jets beat the Rams. So it's been like the stars crossed thing. This like Romeo and Juliet, the Jags and Trevor Lawrence. And then you get Urban Meyer. It's a completely flipped on its head team now. The team is interesting. The team is fun to watch. Jacksonville is going to be a team trying to sell tickets. If I would say anything, these were going to be your players to watch out for. The triple, the three T's, Travis Etienne, Trevor Lawrence, and Tim Tebow. Say what you want about Tim Tebow, whether it's you think that he's taking a job away from somebody or he shouldn't be allowed to play after being removed for eight years. This was a business decision. Jacksonville is a franchise that barely is able to even fill out 75% of their seats. They're a franchise that's looking to sell tickets, sell merchandise, sell their brand. They want to be a Dallas Cowboys. They want to be a Pittsburgh Steeler. They want to be a New England Patriot. They want to be the 49ers. They want to be iconic. To Jacksonville, to Jacksonville, it's an expansion franchise that's getting their feet wet in the ground in the NFL. They're not a Green Bay Packer or a Kansas City Chief logo where you see and you're like, oh, that is the NFL right there. It's kind of that odd child or that weird cousin that comes during Thanksgiving. They're kind of like, ooh. Oh, oh, I don't know about that. Jacksonville's been trying to be relevant for so long. They had that run in 2018, but it was kind of a boring team. It was defense and running. There wasn't no flash or flair to it. You add Trevor Lawrence. You add the Christian Tim Tebow who wears his religion on his sleeve and gets insane in the locker room. We got 30 minutes. Ah, some stuff like that. You get Travis Etienne, a dynamic player from Clemson who played alongside Trevor Lawrence. You got the TNT logo now with a... I would have seen them post on their social media that, that Trevor to Travis, TNT, you got a brand, you can make shirts, you can make jerseys. Jacksonville's trying to sell tickets. Now you're going to counter that with, they need to be good too. Well, that's going to come in time. I've said on this podcast many times, Urban Meyer's got to learn how to be an NFL head coach. Learn the temperature of the room, learn how to be a coach, learn how to be a, evolve into it, learn how to be the guy in the room, be the man in the room that everybody looks to. If you just heard a... Rrr, it's because that damn motorcycle keeps crossing the, the street every single time I'm trying to record it. So, ugh. But I, I digress. I think that what you need to look for in this TNT thing is that you really have to look at it is, am I looking to go 6-11 and 11 this year? And every game, every home game, Jacksonville, there's 100,000 fans waiting to watch. The owner, Shahid Khan of the Jacksonville Jaguars, wants two things. He wants to be a relevant team, win games, and he wants to be a team that people want to buy jerseys. Tim Tebow's already a top five selling jersey. The team is a brand, they're a name to look out for, and that's what Jacksonville has to look. What I look for with games is the QB matchups. The AFC South's main opponent is going to be the NFC West. So you've got Russell Wilson, you've got Kyler Murray. Trevor Lawrence is going to have divisions within his own, his duels within his own divisions. You've got Ryan Tannehill, Carson Wentz. I think a lot of these games, you're going to expect the Jags to start slow because I think that they're going to be learning. Like Trevor Lawrence, he's going to have to learn how to be a pro. He's going to lose a game. Oh, no. He's going to have to learn how to be a pro. Urban Meyer's going to have to learn how to be a professional head coach. It's going to be a lot of moving parts, but I think at the end of the season, you can, you're going to see a lot of really good things. You're going to see them be able to move the ball down the field, be crisp with their drives. Trevor Lawrence is going to light the league up. I think it'll be similar to a, an RG3 type thing where it's kind of rough in the beginning, but he's going to pick it up in the end. Not where I'm, I'm saying that Trevor Lawrence is going to have some disastrous injury that like derails his entire career, but it'll be something along those lines where he's going to be good, but it's going to take him a little bit longer to be able to adjust to that NFL atmosphere, that environment, the speed. It'll be something that'll really, you'll really see that progression. You'll really go, wow, and appreciate it. I think that's what to look out for, for Jacksonville. My headline is going to be they're not satisfied with 1-0, but they're getting more than just that. And that Duval has found their savior in T-Law. Or you could say T-Law for Duval. 
something cheesy, something corny. I think Jacksonville's got their guy. They've got their foundation. They're going to have their business. It's going to be something really exciting to look forward to. All right, we're going to move to second place. And I'm going to say Houston. You're going to go, what? Houston in second place? Well, they went 4-12, and 12, so let's calm down. 2020. If 2020 was a mess for everybody, it was certainly a mess for Houston. Everything that could have gone wrong went wrong. You had head coach that traded DeAndre Hopkins to the Cardinals for chips. You had Deshaun Watson, who played like an MVP, but went 4-12. You had J.J. Watt, who played fantastic, but went 4-12. This is a roster that has a lot of holes, a lot of problems. The offensive line, the defense, the secondary, running backs. It's all a big, giant, fat mess. And when I was like, what players am I going to look out for? The draftees, Nico Collins out of Michigan, David Mills out of Stanford, Philip Lindsay. And I just put Deshaun Watson in question marks. I know that there's a big overall picture with Deshaun Watson right now. There's a big mess legally with him. What is happening with him? Who is he seeing? What is going on? I have no idea. I'm not going to delve into the case and the facts of it and all that because that's just not what the show's going to be about. We're not criminal minds or anything like that. We're just trying to have fun and talk some football. And occasionally yell at the road whenever people drive by. I mean, shouldn't the entire... I'm, I'm kidding when I say this. Shouldn't the entire neighborhood know that the man with the plan is on? That sounds totally egotistical, but it's kind of funny to say out loud and cringe at the same time. So if you're right now like, ooh, I get it. Uh, but I was kidding, so let's get that out of the way. But I think some players to watch too. Philip Lindsay, if I hadn't said it before, I think that he's going to be looking for something to prove because he's had really good seasons, but Denver's kind of thrown him out on the curb. I think that Houston... They could be a team that gets trap games. If we're looking out for games to watch for, the way I see Houston is, is they're going to have this chip on their shoulder. They're going to be that up-and-coming guy. He's your blue-chip prospect, but he's not good enough yet. There's going to be a lot of players on this team like Mark Ingram who have been kind of cast aside. And the way you could look at Houston is a team of cast-aside players that want to put something together and make something great. Do they have the roster for it? I don't know. But they could be a team that traps people. Like You have the NFC West. You could have Seattle come to town. And then, whoa, Houston kind of comes out of nowhere for a game and beats them. Or, whoa, they kind of pound out a game and take down the Titans or the Colts. They could be a team that really is a trap game. I don't think they're going to be very good. I think they're looking at 2-15, and 3-14, and 14, something along those lines. It's just not a roster that's built for it yet. There are so many holes that even Deshaun Watson, playing like an MVP, could not cover up, throwing for 4,000 yards, not double-digit interceptions. It's just not enough to be able to mask up those kind of problems. So to say that David Mills from Stanford can do it, it's pretty unlikely. But I think that if he's the guy moving forward and he's the QB, it'll be a growing pain. It'll be a process. But I think Houston could have an identity to move forward with. It's a best chip on their shoulder team. That we have guys who want to be here. We've been cast aside. Let's make something of it. That could be your Houston Texans identity. Now, for a whole storyline, I, I know you're going to go, don't use the space joke. Don't use the space joke. But Houston, we have a problem. Houston's going to have a lot of them this year. They're going to be an interesting team to watch, not only because the NFL memes or the, the jokes and the slander are going to be really ridiculous, but I think it's because are they going to be able to build an identity? Can they make something out of nothing? Can they go to this new space in their franchise? No pun intended there. I know you're going to, you're like... You're banging your head on your desk right now. You're like, dude, stop with the puns, my God. But they could be something that's really exciting. I keep talking about them. I really have this confidence that if there's a team that's struggling or there's a team that's kind of in this lull, like maybe San Francisco with Garoppolo, they're down two games or something. Houston could come up and just out of nowhere beat them. Now you're going to go, whoa, 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 why are you podcasting this? But I think that identity could go a long way for a team that's really been searching for answers for a long time. All right, we're going to take a short break. When I return, we're going to talk about the Colts and the Titans. Grace Divisional Breakdown continues. This is the Man with the Plan podcast, episode 31. We will be right back. All right, and we are back. This is the Man with the Plan podcast, episode 31. Guys, if you stayed through this long, I hope you've enjoyed what you've listened to. This was the AFC South version of our Grey's Divisional Breakdown. It's kind of weird. It's like Grey's Divisional Breakdown Episode 2, but Episode 31 of the Man With Plan podcast. It's kind of wild. It's kind of cool. So, let's dive into the second place team in the AFC South. 
the Indianapolis Colts. So how do I define their 2020? I think it was a team with balance. I think with Phillip Rivers, he brought in a quarterback that could learn a system really easily, a guy that could make good throws, make good decisions, and he did. And most part, Indianapolis was a really good football team. They weren't necessarily flashy or fun to watch. They were a strong defensive team with a lot of balance. They ran the football more than they threw it. Jonathan Taylor, obviously, is a standout. They were a team that, when they played Buffalo in the playoffs, and you could see the limitations on Phillip Rivers' arm, it was time, I was thinking to myself, man, what if this team had an Andrew Luck, or a quarterback with a lot of excitement, or a quarterback that could move around? They might have beaten that Buffalo team, and it would have been a really, really good 7 seed that could challenge any team in the AFC. So what did Colts Nation do? They went out and got Carson Wentz, of all players. And Carson Wentz is immediately carries controversy because the injuries, the failure with the Eagles. Yes, he got him that one Super Bowl, but Nick Foles carried him to the playoffs twice. It's a whole thing with Carson Wentz. It's a lot of baggage. Was Indianapolis willing to pay the price with Carson Wentz? I, I wish you guys could see right now. I like, got my hands both like that shrug, the Michael Jordan shrug. I'm like, oh, I don't know what to do. <laughs> But I have a lot of confidence with what the Colts are doing with Carson Wentz because I think you need to two things with Carson. I think you need a solid run game. I think you need a solid O-line. And I think you need receivers that are dependable because when you had someone like Nelson Aguilar who's came a long way, dropped a lot of balls in 2019. 2020 he had a fantastic year, still some drops, but something that Carson Wentz really needs is for the picture around him. He, he's got the frame, he's got the nail, he's got the hammer, he's hammered in the nail. What he needs is that picture to stay up there and not have any wind blow it off of its course. It needs to stay in frame. And if it can stay in frame, the picture is going to look really good. But if the nail's not set in right or you have the wall's kind of broken down and it starts to crack, the picture doesn't look as good. Or maybe the glass is a little broken. For Carson Wentz, the picture in the frame need to be exactly the way it is. It needs to be a perfect picture. And the Colts are that perfect picture. Good O-line. Jonathan Taylor's a solid running back. Year two will look to develop. Michael Pittman, T.Y. Hilton, some really great weapons for Carson Wentz and really a lot of good things to work with. A fantastic defense that was in the top 10. There's a lot of good things to look forward to with Indianapolis. Some players to watch. Darius Leonard, Xavier Rhodes, Michael Pittman, Jonathan Taylor, Carson Wentz. There's going to be a lot of guys that have been there, done that, and you add a new quarterback in that you hope can take you over the top. I think that could be it with Carson Wentz. Remember, with Philadelphia, when he won the MVP, that picture was right with the frame. They had solid receivers like Oshon Jeffrey. Zach Ertz was playing in the prime of his career. Great running game, solid O-line. Philadelphia was at the top of the world. He was going to win the MVP had he not torn his ACL. Could the Colts give Carson an MVP-like season? I think so. I think what you have to look at it is that there's a certain big if can they win this division? Can they take that next step? I am really excited for Indianapolis. The games to watch, obviously, the NFC West matchups. How does Carson Wentz match up against the improved division? How do they match up against an improved Jacksonville team, a Houston team with a chip on their shoulder, a Titans team that has been there, done that, Ryan Tannehill, Derrick Henry, Mike Vrabel, a solid squad. If Carson can carry in a stronger division, it'll be really interesting to look out for because you've got teams like Kansas City. You got teams like Buffalo. You got teams like New England, like LA. There's a lot of great teams. Can Carson be a part of that great, that good group where you like make those QB pyramids or those team pyramids, like the tiers? Can he be in that A tier? I think he can. I think your headline for the Colts is going to be that Carson Wentz is back. The MVP for Carson Wentz. I think that it won't be an MVP like season, but it'll be enough for Indianapolis to make a lot of noise in the AFC. All right, let's talk about Tennessee. Run, Derek, run. That was 2020. Derek Henry had the rushing crown, the rushing title. He just gets better every year. He's so much fun to watch. If you're watching Tennessee, you're watching to see if they run the football. I love watching Derek Henry. He just runs people over. Poor Josh Norman. Poor any poor anybody that tries to tackle him. God, if I try to tackle him, it'd be it'd be tough. It there's a certain video that you guys really want to see. We might. Get in a clip of me getting absolutely ran over. That's what Derrick Henry is to most corners. I think for what Tennessee needs, it was a solid offense that made up for a really weak defense. And they tried to address that in the draft with Caleb Farley. 
Now, is Caleb Farley a risk? Certainly. Is he a great player? Certainly. I think for Tennessee, it's one thing. They need to improve their defense. They have a fantastic offense. They have a solid run game. Ryan Tannehill gets... Ryan Tannehill is one like Carson Wentz. If the picture is set up in the frame right, it goes well. But when things start to fall apart, it gets a little messy. And with Derrick Henry, the picture is usually in the frame 100% of the time. It looks good. It's standing up straight. But not all the time. And I think in the playoffs when, like Baltimore, they decide we're going to make Ryan Tannehill beat us, and he couldn't. Can he get that next level? Can he make that next step? I'm confident that Ryan Tannehill is able to do that. But I don't know if teams have kind of found the formula. They've exposed it. There have been times where Ryan Tannehill looks really good, and then there's times where he doesn't. And that's like that's such an empty take on my part. But I've watched Tennessee for years now. They added Ryan Tannehill. They look solid off play action. But when it's 3rd and 10, my confidence just drops. Can he make those throws? Absolutely. Can he make those re- make those reads? I don't know. There's a lot of ifs and a lot of questions with Ryan Tannehill. The Tennessee Titans will be a playoff team on whether Ryan Tannehill is able to make those plays when Derrick Henry isn't rushing for 3 trillion yards. That's what I want to look for. When you look for games, it's teams that can really do well against the run. You'll see what this team is made of when Ryan Tannehill has to put the team on his back and really show what he is made of, the first round draft pick out of Texas A&M. Show what he has to bring to the table. Not Derrick Henry. It's what Ryan Tannehill can bring to the table. Because we know what Derrick Henry can do. When you give him the ball, he's going to hit somebody, and he's going to run for a lot of yards. But what can Ryan Tannehill do when it's third and long, when it's the run game's not working out, and they go, Ryan, we need you to win the game. Can he do that for Tennessee? All right, we're going to do the predictions. In fourth place, it's going to be Houston. It's going to be a mess. But I think that could be a team that could get a game or two off of a team that's on a bad stretch or like a Jets team or a team that really isn't looking really like the Texans are a threat. It's like where the Patriots last year, they beat the Ravens in Sunday Night Football and then they got absolutely clobbered by Houston the next week because New England wasn't really viewing Houston as a threat. If teams don't take Houston seriously, it could be a problem. In third place, it's going to be the Jacksonville Jaguars. It's going to be a good third place, but it's going to be a team that's going to be competitive in the end and it's going to be kind of a rough start in the beginning. In second place, I have Tennessee. I think they're going to make the playoffs, but it's going to be really close. I think Ryan Tannehill is going to have to make a big leap this year because I think teams are going to start to really pour in on Derrick Henry and say, Ryan, you got to beat us. In first place, I have the Colts. I think Carson Wentz is an MVP candidate, and I think that it's going to look really good for Indianapolis. It'll be like Andrew Luck was there all over again. And that was my divisional breakdown. That was... The AFC South next week we'll be doing the AFC North. The interesting AFC North with Baltimore, Cleveland, Joe Burrow and the Bengals, and of course, the Steelers. My name is Gray Man. This is the Man with the Plan podcast, episode 31. I hope you enjoyed. Have a fantastic week and take care. Mm-hmm.